Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Taylor Tuesday. I'm Dr. Ira Krauss, and I'm honored to have Dr. William Duke as our guest speaker tonight. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, interfill, technical tips and case studies. I just want to tell everybody that I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, for those of you who, that, who are regular attendees on Taylor Tuesday, uh, I think you all know that I relocated to Whitefish, Montana, and I am out here enjoying myself. Uh, life is good. Had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday, and I sure hope that you all did the same. Um, we've been doing this now. Uh, we started doing this probably, I, I want to say, back in March or April, and um, it's started out as something where uh, we wanted to uh, give back to the community, which is something that we've been doing um, through Taylor, uh, to, to the medicine community, the podiatric community, and, and to our patients that we serve. And, um, it's really become, uh, really for me, a labor of love, something that I enjoy doing. I mean, uh, Taylor Medical, uh, it is a business, but we were created not really to be just a business. We We were created to educate people and to teach people. That's why we do these webinars every two weeks now. You know, initially we focused on surviving through COVID. Now we're just trying to educate people in general on, on, on things that they can do. Um, I just want to let you know that um, all of our webinars are recorded and available on the website. If you go um, to the upper right-hand corner and you, uh, after you get to our website at www.taylormedical.com, look in the upper right-hand corner for the webinars tab and click on that. And all of the webinars that we've done are, have been archived. I mean, we've had a variety of different webinars uh, on a multitude of different areas and different topics. And if you ever want to find out about the different um, breadth of what Taylor does, I think watching some of those webinars will be very, very helpful. Um, you know, it's interesting when we, when we got started, it was a matter of, um, what are we here for? And I think people misunderstand the fact that we're not here just because we want to give you the best price. I think that we can be competitive on the majority of things that you purchase. I think what people don't realize is before you buy anything for your practice, you should reach out to Taylor. Because of our 30 vendors, because of our large relationship with Interlear, which is a huge GPO, we have access to millions of, of, of products and hundreds of thousands of product lines. We do a free cost analysis for you. We do what I call apples to apples and apples to oranges. Apples to apples is if this is what you use and this is what you want to continue using, we'll give you a price estimate. We'll give you a cost estimate. I will tell you that on our apples to apples cost estimate, we're saving practices anywhere between 15 and 20%. And then I do what's called apples to oranges. We may replace um, some of your products that you're using with um, uh, branded products by, the, by some of our other companies. And sometimes we get, we're getting savings anywhere between 18 and 30%. So everybody is very, very different. Um, we've definitely struggled through COVID. Um, but I will tell you that you can get a cost analysis by sending us the products you're currently using in an Excel spreadsheet. You know, put the vendor, the description, the manufacturer, the SKU, the units of measurement. Um, if you're using certain vendors that allow you to download um, your ordering history for the last year, you can download it and send it immediately to uh, admin at taylormedical.com. Or if you're still just ordering from different companies and you want to send us um, some of your invoices to price things out, we'll do it any way we can. We're here to provide a service and we want to help make your practices um, uh, flow and work better. Um, as I told you earlier today, earlier this evening, our goal is to make sure that we, um, we, we educate you. So it's not just about, okay, buy this. And so I'm honored that we have, um, Dr. William Duke, uh, from, uh, uh, Jefferson city medical group to talk to us about the use of interfill. Um, I've actually been using Interfill for years uh, when I was in practice, and my company currently uses it. Um, it's a great product for being able to offer patients an alternative to um, the traditional standard of care for some of our musculoskeletal problems that have been happening. Um, Dr. Duke grew up in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, and um, after all of his training and 
um, and, and, and education, uh, getting married and having children, he decided to go back home uh, and came to Missouri. Um, I, 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 I was I was telling Dr. Duke that this is one of the first people that I've had on Taylor Tuesday that I don't know. And I, I know most podiatrists around the country. So it's kind of unique to meet somebody new tonight. The only thing I didn't tell him was, you know, I was, you know, I don't know about the St. Louis Cardinals. I know he's a big oh, Cardinals fan. Here we fan, go. But, here we go. Um, but, but, but I'm not going to go down that road. But anyway, um, Dr. Duke, I want to welcome you to Taylor Tuesday. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to disappear off the screen and allow you to talk. I will come back afterwards and uh, we'll come up and answer some questions that have developed. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to let it turn it over to you and let you do your thing. How's that sound? Oh, that sounds great. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice introduction. And we did get to know each other just a little bit before we started. And, you know, I do have a, a business partner who is from New York. You're from New York. We, we are able to share some of that, but it's probably best that we don't talk about baseball. That might get in the way uh, of our conversation here tonight. I know we could probably go off a topic very easily with that. You know, I've been asked to talk about Interfill tonight and go through some of my case studies with you and some technical tips that I may have from doing a pretty good amount of Interfill. And the first thing we're going to do is just talk about kind of how I like this format to go. Uh, I'm kind of a simple guy. I, I practice you know, podiatry during the day. And when I leave my practice, I go and coach high school football at night. And if it's not in season, then we're, you know, we're in the weight room and we're lifting weights. So to me, things are very much, uh, let's make this like we're sitting around a table talking about something. If you have a question, just ask, we'll get to it. You know, doc, don't feel bad stopping me and say, Hey, we have some questions here. Let's go through that and, and whatnot. Uh, but I really think at the end of this, what I want you to be able to take away is a couple of things. Number one is that there is other options for you. And I'm going to tell you a personal story as we get going here and, and why I think that's so important for you to know. And number two is we need to use the resources that we have to make a difference between being almost right and right. To me, there, there's a difference between the two, and we'll dive into that as we go. I am going to bore you a little bit with some, you know, science stuff and take you all the way back to first year with, you know, some histology and all that kind of stuff. But we'll get through that and we'll we'll go for it. But again, thanks to Taylor Medical for having me. Hopefully, I don't bore you too bad. And uh, let's get started. So really, every patient is different, and results are going to vary no matter what you do, what you use. Make sure you look through the risk information. Make sure you understand what you're using this for. Um, again, these are kind of the required slides. It's like that 18 seconds of the end of the 30-second commercial about a medication that you hear on TV, and I'm sure we'll hear before we get this vaccine here in a, a month or so. But uh, participate in some training before you use Interfill. You know, the case studies, they're mine, they're nobody else's, they're just one doc's individual kind of study with this and uh, my results and your results may vary, but I can tell you my results are have been outstanding and something that as good as they've been, it, it's been enough that makes me excited to talk about this. Um, we're all professionals here and you have to understand that we're, you know, we're doing this for an educational type of purpose. So Interfill is basically intended for the use of replacement or supplementation of damaged or inadequate tissue, okay? It's used to treat soft tissue voids, correct soft tissue deficits, uh, defects, and during the repair of any kind of complicated surgical closure. Now, what we're going to talk about today is how I use them in some basic soft tissue damage that we deal with on an everyday basis. But... There are times when you can use this for all those things it says on the left-hand side of that screen there, whether it's medical or surgical conditions, you know, exposed structures like bone, tendon, ligament, things like that. So we're not going to dive into a lot of that today, but know that there are those options. Obviously, don't use this stuff if there's infections going around or if somebody's had an adverse reaction. Again, this is, the, uh, this is that commercial that we have to give before we dive into the real stuff. 
and don't put it in somebody's artery or in their eye. I don't know why you would want to do that, but try to avoid that. Everything has an expiration date. Be mindful of what you're doing and follow the package insert. It's not that terribly difficult. So what is it? Interfill is a human placental connective tissue matrix. It's sourced from the placenta after you remove the umbilical cord and the amniotic membrane. Again, it's an ECM. It's intended to be used as replacement or supplementation of damaged or just inadequate integumental tissue. It's free of cells. It's free of cell debris, DNA, and ex extraneous proteins. It has no growth factors. It has no cytokines. What I want you to think of it is like a scaffold. You're providing something for your body to heal across, okay? Uh, you could sort at room temperature because of the gamma sterilization. And, and really, the process is here through this stepwise approach, right? You have the eligibility. They have the slicing and grinding. They have the washing, lyophilized, sterilized package. They have all that stuff that goes on. And while all that is really great, what it comes down to is it's structured with collagen, elastin, some fibronectin, laminin, glycosaminoglycans, some proteoglycans, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but ultimately, when you look at it, it allows for the attachment of monocytes to secrete cytokines. So you initiate inflammatory response and remodeling phase. And that's what we need for healing, right? We've all gone through those types of classes. Okay. It's boring. I get it. We have to go through this to get to the the fun stuff, as I call it, but it's not Amnion. There's a lot of Amnion based products out there. You can, you know, you could talk to Taylor Med and a lot of places and they can give you some really great tips of this, but this is not an amniotic membrane product. It's an extracellular matrix that basically, again, acts as a scaffold, fills that space to give you and maintain a structure. Uh, so whatever deficit you might have or defect you might have, it allows you to help with that, right? All right, here's the regulatory slide. I'm not going to read this slide to you. What I'm going to tell you is it comes from healthy, full-term births, no abortive fetuses, nothing like that. Um, it comes in a vial and, and or pre-filled syringes. But I do tell my patients that it's from full, healthy, live uh, births. Everything has been washed and cleaned, and you can, you can feel safe about it because I, I do think that that is an important factor. We're going to go through some benchtop research here, and we're going to go through this pretty quick, actually. Um, we all know that the monocytes get there first. The connected tissue matrix or interfill gives you that scaffold to allow proliferative uh, proliferation relative to the collagen coated tissue and the culture source. We can see slides here of uh, cell attachment and cell spreading. And it talks about the normal inflammatory phase and proliferative phase. Um, and in that left box there, basically, that's where the fibroblasts attach quickly to the interfill part, uh, particles. And in the right one, you could see where that is beginning to spread, creating that extracellular matrix. Sorry if you hear my clicking. I'm trying to be as efficient as possible. In this slide, you can see all the viable cells in green and the, the CTM and the dead cells in red. And if you look at the viability uh, their graph on the right, you can get some good information from just day one to day three. When we talk about some in vitro wound closure assays, you can read through that in there and, and kind of look at it. And if anybody, if, if that's kind of what you do, if you're really into that science part of it, uh, there is a reference down there at the bottom for you. But if we look at the endothelial cell response and the angiogenesis, uh, especially in B there, you can, you can kind of go through the entire process and know that these, the science is there, it backs it. And one of the things I, I will routinely ask people whenever they bring a new product to it is what evidence-based medicine do you have? Tell me about the science. And now I'm listening to it. They may be talking over my head in some instances, to be honest with you. Uh, but I'm listening to it saying, okay, does this make sense, right? Does this get you to a right answer or is it almost right? And if you can't really understand it and it's almost right, it's probably wrong. And we're going to dive into that a little bit more later. So essentially, what did it come down to? What did the research show us? 
you get monocyte attachment, you get differentiation into macrophages, you get a first inflammatory phase of wound healing, you get a scaffold for cell attachment and proliferation. So the fibroblast gives you one of those key cell types to repair and proliferate. And then it allows for endothelial cell attachment and, and consequent. So you can get the wound closure if you need it. Uh, but all of the studies in vitro suggest that it gives you all of the key aspects of wound repair cascade. Now, in a nutshell, what does that mean? You can be sure that when you use this, you're getting the proper response that you need to really feel like you're making a positive difference, right? So let's dive into the fun stuff now. We've got through the science. We've got through the requirements of what we need to talk about. But let's now dive into the fun stuff and what we need to know. I'm going to back up to this slide here real quick. This was the first slide we saw, but I'm going to I'm going to tell you a quick personal story about me and my practice. So I've been in practice for approximately 15 years at Jefferson City Medical Group. I'm the first podiatrist that this hundred provider practice ever took a chance on, I guess. And I have. You know, I have a partner now uh, since after my first year there because we were extremely busy. And since training, it was always for different things like plantar fasciitis. Give them a shot. Give them stretches. Give them orthotics. Do this. Do that. Follow the, follow the protocol of how you get there. And what I started to notice is that not everybody was the same. I couldn't put everybody into a protocol, at least not the protocol I had. So why was it taking so long to get people better? Why was it taking so long for this cascade of events and treatments that guys taught me, very good clinicians, to make a difference? What was I doing wrong? How was I not getting the same clinical outcomes or results? I was using the same injectables. I was using the same stretching sheet, same orthotic labs, same spiel when I talked to the patient. But what was it that was different? Well, I kind of went back to the training that I got from my residency director, Dr. Daryl Laffa from Mount Sinai and, and Shoal College, and just went back to let's let's go all the way back and let's talk anatomy, right? Anatomy is that's that's the game changer for everybody, right? We have to have anatomy. We have to be able to try and help and restore anatomy. Think about it from a wound. If somebody has a wound, they're missing part of their anatomy. You're trying to give that anatomy back no matter how many layers it is of skin and subcutaneous tissue they need. If they have a tendon tear, you're trying to debride that tendon if you have to surgically and get it back to looking somewhat normal. So for fasciitis, what I notice is that why am I continuing to give people shots and of steroid and potentially weaken that anatomical structure? Now I did open, e I did open fasciotomies, I did EPFs, the whole gamut, always searching for something that felt right, not almost right. And what I found is when I went back and talked about anatomy, there is no other anatomical structure on the plantar aspect of the foot that is has the length or the width of the plantar fascia. So in my mind, if I couldn't make people better early on in my practice, it was, well, go cut the fascia. It's too tight. Uh, there's something else going on. It needs to loosen up. And I would cut the fascia and people would feel better. They would do generally well in the neighborhood of 80% or so over the years. And I thought, why am I not trying to improve the anatomy? Well, lo and behold, I kept thinking, kept thinking, kept thinking, doing more and more research, trying to be uh, a student every day. And I said, you know what? I need to stop doing stuff that's going to have detrimental effects. And I want to try and heal this tissue back. Not everybody who has plantar fasciitis needs a cortisone shot. When I started doing that, I started developing different protocols. And I said, well, maybe I should get an MRI on more people. And for some of you, maybe that's not feasible. But I started to get an MRI on more and more of my plantar fascial inflammation patients, especially those who had had a three to six month history of fasciitis or they had come to me from another provider. What I started finding on these MRIs was more and more tears were noted on the fascia. More and more people had a 
a defect or a deficit. So in my mind, I was like, well, I can't put, I shouldn't put steroid in there. It's only going to weaken that tissue. Now we can cuss and discuss that all we want, but at the end of the day, I started saying, how do I fix the anatomy? And thankfully I, I came across this product and it has been a game changer in my practice. And if any of you ever have any questions, you're welcome to get my contact information and reach out to me, text, email, phone call, doesn't matter anytime, day or night. I don't sleep a whole lot. So we can talk about it and dive into all of it above and beyond what we're doing in the presentation here. But today we're going to talk about some key issues for me and how I have made them better in my practice. Plantar fasciitis and fasciosis, plantar fascial tears, Achilles tendonitis, posterior tibial tendonitis and tears, believe it or not, and even some lateral ankle ligamentous problems. And by the end, really, I hope I convince you that we're, I'm right in my thinking, I'm not almost right like I was, and that you can branch out and look at other ways to take care of this. So that's my soapbox. That's my personal story of how I kind of felt like I was failing people and how I just kind of scaled it back. But let's go into the technique of what we do in my office, in my clinical practice, and then we'll dive into some case studies. So this is just a real simple picture of what happens. And I'll give you a clinical history. A patient comes in with heel pain, x-rays show a spur, don't, doesn't show a spur. I do an ultrasound of all of these patients in the office, uh, measuring their fascial thickness, looking for um, increased density and hyper, hyper acuity and uh, acuity rather, and um, any place where there might be anacody to suggest a, a really bad tear. And then I send a vast majority of these patients, especially for plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, uh, for an MRI. And I compare my findings on ultrasound to this. And the vast majority of people I see have a partial tear of some kind. They have a defect. That defect needs a scaffold, hence interfill. Uh, so I talk to them about it. I tell them all that geeky stuff in those slides. You know, this is from full healthy live term burst. There's no live cells in here. There's no DNA in here. It provides a scaffold to help heal across. And after doing a large number of these injections, I can tell you that I have had this not in a, um, a large number. I can tell you that I've had it not help three people. So my success rate is extremely high for this. And I'm not selling this to patients. I'm telling them this is another treatment option that we can provide for you. And we can tell you a timeline of here's when you're going to feel better. Here's why you're going to be better. And this is what we use. Once a patient decides that, they come into the office and um, I always anesthetize the area. I, I just simply use five cc's of bupivacaine, pick whatever you like. Um, but my medical assistants know this is exactly how the setup will be. Uh, and then I do a physical exam of the area. So for this patient, they had uh, um, some Achilles tendinosis with some partial tearing. And what I use is a simple plus minus system. Right. So I will palpate each and every one of these individual areas, asking the patient to tell me yes or no. Does it hurt in these areas? The larger the plus sign, that's the greater area of symptoms, obviously. And then I use this as a guide to anesthetize the proper area before I give them this interfill injection. But what I also do is compare that to my, my MRI findings and my ultrasound findings, because remember I said I ultrasound all of these people. I ultrasound them before, at the time of injection, and at the time of follow-up. So, you know, a little practice management there, that helps as well. But it also gives me good, verifiable data that the patient can see and correlate with how they're feeling. So in this instance, it's a person with a uh, partial tearing of their Achilles tendon. We could see that on both the T1 and T2 images of the MRI. And I've just kind of done my plus minus system. I told you I'm a simple guy. So yes or no, <laughs> does it hurt or does it not? And I compare that. From there, my medical assistants will uh, prepare the interfill. I usually mix uh, the particulate with 0.4 cc's of whatever local I'm using, in this case, bupivacaine. And I, they know that I'm like a germaphobe, so I clean everything down with betadine and 
betadine again, and then alcohol, and then when we're done, alcohol again, and um, literally just a Band-Aid over the injection site. So after I numb them up, I wait five or 10 minutes, come back. My medical assistants typically have this ready to go. They do a great job with that. Uh, and that's just kind of a, a quick, easy picture of the setup. So what is the process of how we take care of it? Once they're anesthetized, I inject the 0.4 cc's of the interfill, and they have larger sizes too, but this is the only size that I use. Um, for the Achilles, usually through a lateral approach, obviously we we'll want to avoid the neurovascular bundle and stuff. Um, but everything is under ultrasound guidance compared to the plus minus and their ultrasound and MR examination. If they can't have an MR and we have to get CT for something and we, we could do that as well. Um, what you're going to see in the following images is the interfill actually in those spaces because it shows up bright white on the ultrasound. For plantar fasciitis, I put all of my patients into a boot afterwards. Uh, typically, I tell them a good over-the-counter arch support, uh, whatever you have in your office or some customs if they already have them, if they've tried them. If your patients are like mine, I will have patients that literally bring me a shopping bag of inserts in and go, can you look at all these for me? I've been to four docs and I've gotten four different pair of inserts and I'm just not sure which ones I'm supposed to be wearing. Um, but I do put them in a boot for two to three weeks after I give them a shot for this for fascial problems, six weeks for Achilles ruptures. And I also put two heel lifts into the cast boot as well. And the thought process there is using the non-operative management techniques for Achilles tendon ruptures, full ruptures in this same manner after I give them interfill. A very low volume prescription for pain meds, uh, and I tell them that NSAIDs and Tylenol are okay post-injection, but they cannot have NSAIDs for five days prior to the injection. So five days prior, no NSAIDs. And then I make sure they, uh, they limit their exercise greatly while they're in the boot. Usually I tell them after a week or so, if you want to ride a bike or something like that, it's perfectly fine. But if I wouldn't let you do it without interfill, I'm not going to let you probably do it when you have interfill. And then ice daily. Um, Again, we can debate the studies that say ice is good and ice is bad all you want, but I think it's a, a good option for patients, um, especially because it seems to work. So we're going to go through a bunch of case studies here. There's five of them. Uh, we may not hit them in this order, uh, but we're going to go through there and we're going to talk about each one. I'm going to show you ultrasound pictures. I'm going to show you before and after. We'll show you an amazing MRI of a plantar fascial tear after interfill injection. And we'll go through um, probably one that it's, um, it's a young athlete that is, is probably one of my biggest success stories that I love from interfill. So let's talk about plantar fasciitis. We all know there's studies out there that tell us how thick the plantar fascia should be. What I was lacking is the knowledge of how many people actually have a small partial tear of their plantar fascia. Maybe it's because I didn't ask the best questions. Maybe it's because I was too busy. Maybe it's because I just thought, well, if they follow steps A through G for the protocol, they should be perfectly fine. Once I rearranged my thinking a little bit and actually dove back into the anatomy and said, let's make sure the anatomy is right, I really started to help people a whole bunch more. And the use of an ultrasound in the office, if you're not using one, you should be. I'm not going to say it's 100% standard of care, but I'm going to tell you that it gives you in 20 seconds, it can give you a world of information to help guide your treatment. Interfill has become my treatment of choice for any kind of tearing or rupture of the plantar fascia. Um, I don't do EPFs anymore. I did an open fasciotomy a few weeks ago on a lady um, who actually is one of my three failures. And um, she just... Asked, asked for it. And I tried to talk her out of it. I said, hey, what if I can get this shot for you at no charge? Would you take another one? And she wasn't having any of it. So out of one of my three, I think she's the only plantar fascial surgery I've had to do in a long, long time. And I just choose not to destabilize the, the fascia anymore. Um, here's a good person. In the top, you can see pre-interfill, their fascia is measuring out uh, right around seven at the time of interfill injection, you can see that bright white uh, dense area. That's the interfill. Uh, they're pretty close to the same measurement. 
And here they are five weeks post injection and you could see the reduction of the thickness of the fascia and the patient has very minimal pain at most. They're out of their boot, they're back in normal shoes. And you could say, well, I can get all that same results with a EPF. I can get all that same results with a couple of cortisone shots. I don't need an ultrasound. Um, I would I would challenge you to look at it under ultrasound, really do a thorough evaluation and see what the anatomy looks like long term. Consistent and reproducible. That's what we want. We all want that. That's why we have protocols. That's why we believe in certain things. We believe whether it's a surgical procedure for a forefoot deformity, a rear foot deformity, or whether it's, in my case, treating plantar fasciitis. Here's a person with a one, a one month history of heel pain, no observable tear on MRI. Prior to the injection, you could see again um, what's happening. And there's the interfill through there. Uh, this is actually, you could see the kind of the flow and the overall change for the, the patient you just saw a minute ago um, and how you can see the fascia just dropping down in thickness from injection day to two weeks out to five weeks out. And again, they're only in the boot for a couple of weeks. Here's, here's another example. Fascia is about five millimeters. There's a small partial tear in that top left picture uh, that you could see there with all that increased density. There's a spur as well. Um, they can't, they decided to go through and go through with it and have the interfill, which in my office is a cash pay service. Um, you can see again on the bottom picture a few weeks out that that fascia is back down from where it was on from the day of injection. So it's about a 38% reduction overall. Here's a 25% reduction for a patient a month out who had very minimal pain with exam. Uh, you can see the fascia is just coming back to normal. It looks more normal. And these are just a few that I've pulled out of there. But I can tell you I saw two patients today who were four weeks out. One was four weeks out and one was two or three months out. And you take those ultrasound images and you you check them out. And they, they're in the office and they're like, it doesn't hurt. I feel good. I'm back doing what I want to do. I can I didn't have to have surgery. There's no cost of anesthesia. There's no risk of infection, although we all know it's very, very low in foot and ankle surgery, but those problems aren't there. Here's a 47 year old female. She had an EPF on her left side for a partial rupture in July of 19. She had an injury post-op, kept having pain at her EPF site. She had an injection on June 8 of 2020 and then she had her follow-up. So if you look at the top top screen, it shows where the, her injection was. You can We measured out her fascia. It was over five millimeters thick. Um, and where she was having her pain was right along where the cannula was. Okay. Um, we had done a follow-up MRI and things like that. But at the time of follow-up, 25% uh, reduction of the thickness of her fascia, very minimal pain. And she's back, she was back into a normal shoe after three weeks. And this is a lady who, you know, she was very, very much against having interfill in any way, shape, or form because of the costs associated with it. And it wasn't until she brought her husband with her to the appointment, and he's like, he's telling you he can fix you by giving you this shot. Just get the shot. Uh, and begrudgingly, she said, okay, and dealt with this problem for a long, long time. You know, she had, an, she had an EPF on her other side years ago. It worked out well for her. All she wanted was the EPF. I don't want anything else. I want the EPF. Has an injury. Does it, doesn't get better. And then it takes interfill to fix her. So this is that amazing MRI. And, you know, I don't know if I need to move my uh, head around in here or, or whatnot. If I can, let's see if I can move this around. I'll move it over here. Okay. This is a lady who came in and she had another problem with her ankle and we had to get a follow-up MRI and she had, she had interfill months and months prior and we had to get the MRI and I thought in my head, this would be great because I'm going to be able to see that fashion, how much it's changed. When I give people an interfill shot, they come back three weeks later, they get 
we discuss their progress. I tell them the timeline, tell them where they're at. Uh, I do an ultrasound just to look at it. They want to see too, because now we've educated them on what their fascia should look like. They want to know what, if it looks right. So we show them the picture if they want. Um, but here's a follow-up MRI. And you can see on that left image, that fascia is severely inflamed and torn. Here's a, the follow-up on the right. I'm sorry, the pre-image is on the left. The follow-up is on the right. That fascia is normal. So we go back to anatomy. We've restored anatomy which is one of the things that I sought out to do instead of destabilizing it. So for me, I was like, this is perfect. We've got everything that we need. We should be, we should be perfect at this point, you know? All right, let's move on. All right, the anterior inferior tib fib ligament. This is... This is one of those success stories that I was talking about. Um, 17 year old athlete. She's the best player on her high school basketball team. She has a tear of her anterior inferior tip fib. She's in season, bad injury. We get an MRI. It shows the tear. I talked to her parents um, and said, Hey, we, we can do interfill here. See if we can put this scaffold in there, get your body to heal up. You're young and healthy should do pretty well. We'll get you physical therapy. We'll keep you non weight bearing for a few weeks and then we'll progress you back. Lo and behold, she goes back to her team. She's playing. She leads her team to a final four appearance in high school basketball, which if anybody knows anything, basketball, there's a huge number of basketball teams in every state, and they're in the final four. This is out of the realm of fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis, those, those problems. But if we use the same thought process, it's a scaffold. It helps initiate the inflame, inflammation and proliferation of healing. It should work, and absolutely it did work, and... You know, I think her dad gave me a shout out on social media. So it was like some free marketing too, because, you know, they're in the final four. So everybody's looking at their Facebook posts. So that kind of helped too. But the fact that it helped her meant even more. Let's go to Achilles tendonitis, something you're going to see on a more routine basis. Um, very rarely do I do Hagelin surgery anymore. I did that pretty routinely when I first came out of residency and said, I got to take off that bump. I got to take it off. It's absolutely 100% the problem. You have to have it done. So I took them off and it took people a long time to feel better and get better. And so, well, why is that? What I had to back up and do was reevaluate that as well and say, well, what's really the problem here? They've probably had this bump for years. Is it the Achilles tendon or is it the extra bump? Some people will say it's a combination and for some people it is, but for others, it's just inflammation and tearing of the Achilles tendon. Here's a patient pre-interfill therapy. On the left, you can see how thick that Achilles tendon is. Um, on the top right, you can see we're placing the interfill in there based on that plus minus system and correlating it to the ultrasound and the MRI. And now on the bottom, a few weeks later, that, that Achilles tendon has greatly reduced in thickness, starting to look more normal. And these patients can get back to doing what they want to do. Obviously, they're in a boot for about six weeks, but they can still do that. Here's another patient for Achilles uh, tendon partial tearing. It was an injection day, and you can see every place where we're putting interfill. Uh, and then afterwards, we can get a nice, good measurement for that Achilles tendon. And these patients are walking again. My, again, it's six weeks in a boot with two heel lifts. After the six weeks, I, I tell them to put one heel lift in their shoe. And then after a couple of weeks, start to take a layer off of each heel lift until they can get rid of it completely. And... Knock on wood, it works amazing. It's incredible. Posterior tibial tendon. There's, there's no protocol for this before I started doing it. And actually, this was a lady who I told her that. I go, I don't have a blueprint for how to treat this, but I can tell you based on treating other anatomical problems, this is what I would do. So it was a 50-year-old female with bad posterior tib tendonitis. Didn't respond to any conservative care. You can see all the stuff that's listed there. Initially on MR, no tear. Didn't get better in four months. 
they should be getting better, right? You're doing everything. They're in a boot. They got arch support. So she's got a brace. She's, she's got custom orthotics. She's taken inside. She's doing all this stuff. Well, lo and behold, we take a follow-up MRI and there's a four centimeter tear of her posterior tibial tendon. Now, if you read a textbook, most people will say, well, you got to cut it out. You got to transfer. You got to fuse. You got to do this stuff. My thought process was, for me personally, I would rather try and restore that anatomy if I can using some form of injectable like we have been and see if I can't get her body to initiate a healing response. So we made the decision together to use Interfill. We did three injections, three to four weeks apart um, on January 28th, uh, a little bit after we were done. So about six weeks after we were done, no pain in her manual muscle testing was four out of five, four plus out of five. I actually, since putting this presentation together, have a follow-up MRI showing that tendon being healed. Um, and if anybody's interested in you, you're kind of a nerd like me and you want to see it, I'll, I'll be happy to screenshot it sometime. So here's the MRI, initially a torn posterior tib on the top. On the bottom, the first injection, um, we could see all the bright white interfill in there. Here's the second injection a few weeks later, and then the third. And what I did is I took that segment where it was torn, and each time I addressed just a different segment of that tear. So since it was like a four centimeter tear, I took like a one and a half centimeter segment then the next, then the next, starting proximally and working my way distally. Here's the final appearance of that posterior tib. And if we go back, um, you can see that that tendon is very thick. It's, it's very inflamed. Um, not 100% at the time of this ultrasound at her last a uh, few weeks after her last injection, but it doesn't hurt and her strength was back, which is the most important thing. I want to get on my soapbox for just a minute, um, and then you guys feel free to ask questions. But earlier I told you I really believe there's a difference between being right and almost right. And maybe it was just me being bad at what I did. I don't know. But I was almost right a lot of times. I made a lot of people better. They were, they were happy about it. I'm in a town. It's a small town. Um, I told you I coach high school football. So some of my patients, I'm coaching their sons. Uh, when I go to church on Sunday, I'm kneeling down next to some of my patients. When I'm in the grocery store, I see them. So in my community, you better have answers as to why people are, um, why you're doing what you're doing, right? So I was almost right. And it wasn't until I backed up, kind of re-looked at things. And for me, Interfill has been one of those things that have taken me from almost right to right. And I don't market it. I don't market it at all. I could, I should. Um, but it's definitely the first line therapy for me, for people who have plantar fascial inflammation that's been there for a while, plantar fascial tearing. I don't hesitate. And I don't hesitate because I have the clinical data to prove that it works on well over 150 people. And I have the experience to say, this is what I would do if it was my wife or one of my four boys every day of the week. There's a lot of options out there. This is just one of them. I'm not telling you this should be your only option. I'm telling you from one dude's experience in mid-Missouri that uh, it works. So thanks for having me, guys. Hopefully I didn't run over all my time. You did great. Um, I have to tell you, I, I enjoy um, lectures like this, and, and, and I enjoy the fact that you had clinical experience. I, I do a lot of lecturing myself in the uh, wound care space in limb salvage, and I like to show my cases because I think that's really, you know, a lot of times when you see presentations and they're not your patients, uh, this brings to me, um, it, it, it brings it home. It's, it's, it's real. Um, I, I also will tell you that, you know, I'm a... I, I practiced in a small town. I practiced in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, and had offices in small rural communities. And um, I will tell you that things were very similar. You know, I was um, I was in bowling leagues. I was in the community theater. Uh, I went to the supermarket, and you run into these patients. And um, I was I was I was I was blessed early in my career. I met somebody who was a newscaster who took a liking to me, and I had my own call in. Uh, asked the doctor show for many years on the local NBC affiliate. And so, but what you did here, um, Dr. Duke, is is, is really nice. And um, I, I do have some questions that 
um, that are here. And I, and I wanted to kind of ask you, 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 you really answered a lot. I like the fact that you gave everybody your clinical protocol um, and, your, and your outcomes with everything. Um, but I'm, I'm going to talk to you. That, that some of them are combined questions. I think um, the first thing is, I know you talked about it as your first line of treatment, which I completely get and completely understand. Um, where I was practicing in these smaller communities, and I think a lot of other people um, uh, have similar situations, I had many patients that, that came in that I wanted to provide um, non-covered services. And their first question, you know, is, so my question to you is, how did you perfect, I know you believed in what you're doing, so don't, don't take this the wrong way, but how did you perfect or convince patients that um, paying for this type of treatment when there are alternatives that their insurance covers is going to be the best for them? I know that some people struggle with that. And I was just wondering if you could share a little bit about that. Sure, great question. What I generally tell patients is this, there's a number of things that we can do for you. There's a number of things that when we do do it for you, we're going to have to see how you react to it, right? And I tell them from my clinical experience, I can tell you, you're going to get better this percentage of the time in this length of time. But to do it, you need this product. And unfortunately, it's not covered by your insurance. So whether that's an out-of-pocket expense for you or a health savings plan or an FSA or whatever that may be, this investment is a lot less than what it would cost you if we did something surgically or God forbid you had a surgical problem. So I'm giving you an option that's taken care of A here in the office, has a significantly higher or significantly high success rate that I believe in. And yes, it has a cost to it. But I also tell patients this, it costs this much. Whether you break that up into two or three payments, I don't care. That doesn't bother me. I'm not asking you to put all of it up at front. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. Uh, if you want to, that's fine too. But at the same time, I believe so much in it. I'm willing to let you break it up into a few payments because I know it's going to help you and you're going to come back to see me and you're going to pay that bill. It's okay. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> Well, that's good. So, so that leads me, you know, to the next question is what, what is the cost for patients in your community and, and how many treat, how many injections do you actually give a patient? And if you give multiple, um, what is the time frame difference within the treatments? Perfect. Good question. I charge 750 bucks. So it's $750 for the interfill. And I tell patients, your insurance will literally pay me to stick you with a needle, but they will not pay for the medicine in the syringe. And that medicine is $750. So, and it's one shot. It's one and done. I'm going to give you one shot. Uh, and based on my experience, I know that here's the way it's going to go. And this is exactly what I tell them. On the day of your injection, your pain level is here. When you come back in two to three weeks, your pain will be here. After you get back to activity, it may bump up a little bit because you're becoming more active. But over the next two to three months, it's going to fall away and it's not gonna be there anymore. And I give them that timeline. I tell them, this is how it's gonna be. This is the way you're gonna feel better. And time and time again, I get patients that come in and go, yep, it bumped up a little bit and then it just fell away. As evident with the patient who had that follow-up MRI, who just happened to be on the same extremity for another problem, another ankle problem. Um, you look at it and go, all right, I have a length of time, right? We know things take time to heal. If you are treating a fracture, you might tell somebody it takes six to eight weeks for that bone to heal clinically, not radiographically all the time. Radiographically may take a lot longer, but clinically it's healed in this time period. Soft tissue is no different. It heals. The difference in the foot or the ankle is what? We got to walk on it. So it's not like if you did something in your hand, you just don't grab your coffee cup with that hand for a few days, right? You don't, you use a mouse with a different hand, which is really, really difficult. I've tried that before. It's not easy. Um, so I, I tell them this is one shot. I don't anticipate giving you more except for the person who had the large tear in the posterior tibial tendon. And I told her there is no textbook for this. So I'm, I'm making it up. And I told that lady that it was 750 bucks per injection. Okay. Um, well, I think that's great. I, um, I, I use, I've used Interfill uh, in my practice prior, and 
Um, my doctors in my practice use it, so I'm 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 definitely a believer in in the utilization of the product. Um, I noticed. So you, you've mentioned multiple times about your timeline. Um, is your timeline fairly consistent based on the location of the deformity? Is it based on the patient's comorbidities? Um, how, how do you determine? You know, because I, I I would imagine that you know, although we'd like to think all plantar fasciitis patients are the same, they're not. You know, does it have to do with their foot type? Does it have to do with their size, their activity level? How do you determine your timelines? What I tell people is that, well, I'll break that into two. Number one is anytime I've seen somebody with a continual, continual pain in their fascia and asking certain questions like, Okay, it's past just hurting in the morning. Now, does it hurt with activity? Yes, it starts hurt all day. When does it bother you? It's not stopping, right? So when I look at that timeline, I that usually tells me something else is going on there that I need to look at further. My medical assistants are very good at the fact that they know if somebody comes in with heel pain, either plantar or posterior, they're getting an ultrasound, point blank. They, they get an ultrasound of that area because... More often than not, and this is just another technical tip, I get MRIs approved without peer-to-peers a lot of times because they've had an ultrasound. So when I call them and they go, have they had an ultrasound? Yes, the ultrasound is suggestive of a tear of this. Oh, okay, well, let's get you the MRI. So that saves me some time. Now, when I hear people who've had this pain for three to six months, we should be getting better. We should be, if we're doing something that's working, it should be getting better. If you had a wound that you're doing something for, you're putting whatever topical on you want, and in three to six months, it's not getting better, that's a problem. Nobody would keep doing that, right? You would change up and look for something else. Same thing here. When I hear of people who have had this problem for that long of a time period, I'm just like, I usually say, we got to, we got to change the we got to change the recipe here because something's not working. You know, there was actually a study out of Mayo, I think, that said if you do absolutely nothing for your fascia inflammation, it should go away in two years. Well, who the heck wants to wait two years for their foot to feel better? Nobody, right? As far as the timelines go for post-injection, what I've I've narrowed that down to is saying, okay, soft tissue injuries, generally I need about four weeks to heal. This is how long I would keep somebody in a boot or something for – this type of sprain, strain, whatever it may be. Now, I may tweak that um, from time to time. Like for gentlemen, if you're a taller guy and weigh a little bit more and you have an Achilles tendon problem, I may keep you in the boot closer to that eight-week mark and not the six-week mark because of the longer lever arm and how much force you're hitting the ground with. Um, For a lot of people, for plantar fascial problems, I'm starting to tell them, hey, at that two-week point, you can get out of your boot. You're good. This medicine, it's sticky, it's in there. It's not like it's going to migrate around. I'm trying to just keep you still and reduce some of your activity for a couple of weeks, right? You know, my timelines are effective, but like you mentioned, can they change a little here and there? They can. But when it comes to diagnosing the problem and recommending the treatment, if it's not working after a while, if people aren't getting better, or if you've seen patients, they, I'm sure we all have, right? They've come in and said, oh, I had two or three shots in, in a month and a half with this doc. Like that, that to me, you're not making progress. You're just covering something up. So, so fix it, right? That's, that's how I look at it. It may be the wrong way, but that's what I do. I don't think it's the wrong way at all. I think, I think your outlook is really nice. And, you know, you, you, you just made a comment that I think is, is critical for people. Um, so, you know, I, 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 for those of you who know, I've been involved in do health policy work for many years, and there's been a lot of controversy both with the utilization or overutilization of diagnostic ultrasound, as well as now there's new criteria for MRIs um, and, and, the, and, the, and the multitude for which they're being ordered and how they're being ordered. Um, I think it's very, very good um, guidance the way you actually talk about that, that um, you've actually gotten Um, approval because you already had a positive diagnostic ultrasound, which is probably, you know, what they wanted to do on a, on a first level, because it's really actually inexpensive. Um, And, 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 you know, I will also tell you that 
uh, you know, I was in practice for 30 years and it was a, a long time before I got a diagnostic ultrasound. And, you know, for years I thought, hell, I knew that spot. I knew exactly where I was going to infiltrate the medication. And I got to tell you, uh, there's a big difference between um, using an ultrasound and I believe that it cuts down on the whether you're using alternative treatments other than the interfill, the amount of um, injections that you have to do because it allows you to get it in the right spot. You, you really can't miss. So um, I, I think that you would, you're spot on with that. And um, uh, you know, it's interesting that um, uh, it's, it's good to see that you use that. Right versus almost right. Yeah, I agree. I, I call it almost perfect, right? It's just almost yeah. perfect. There you um, go. Uh, you know, um, my, I, you know, the, the, the other um, thing that comes to mind is, do you use interfill in conjunction with other treatment modalities? I know you mentioned about um, off, uh, offloading in, in, in DME type equipment. Uh, I know you've talked about the diagnostic ultrasound, but I guess, um, you know, there are people that use, um, you know, uh, Extra, uh, extra corporal shockwave therapy. There are some people that like to send their patients for physical therapy. There are other patients that sometimes you use the MLS lasers. Do you do anything in conjunction with the um, with your protocol that you're doing, or do you just do the injection and offload the patients and use ice? It's a great question, and the God's honest truth is, I'm a cheapskate. That that's the truth of it. If I if I would break down and buy shockwave that would be the next thing that i would add into it and i don't use therapy a lot for this some for sometimes i will but very i don't typically do usually i'll recommend that they get uh, some type of custom orthotic if they've had a a plantar fascial tear or a, a long-standing fasciosis i'll recommend a, a custom orthotic to them um, not a lot of uh, i don't have experience with the mls laser i know a lot of people do for pain reduction and that's great uh, and when I find good results, um, again, I'm a cheapskate looking at it going, should I buy that piece of equipment to use it? Um, and the answer is undoubtedly yes. I just can't get myself past that point. So uh, it's a personal thing, not a professional thing. Um, I think shockwave therapy is amazing. I think the research to support it is outstanding with a lot of level one evidence that we should be doing it. Um, that is like the next the next thing to add to it because now maybe those three failures that I had wouldn't have been failures. Well, that's an interesting comment. I'm going to ask you one last question and then I'm going to make some closing comments. Uh, okay. Are you using interfill at all for any wounds? And in particular, have you had any experience using it with uh, exposed bone? Uh, the short answer is no. And the answer and the reason why that answer is no is because I don't see a lot of wounds in my clinic. Um, there is a wound care center at the hospital down the road where I think a lot of the wounds are going and not to um, not to my office and being in the practice that I am with so many other providers. Like I said, we have a, about 100 providers in our medical group. I'm not getting that type of care too much. Most of what I'm getting is some surgical problems, heel pain, fractures, sprains, strains, and, and you know we do do nail care and, and things like that, but we're not getting a lot of that. But the science behind it supports that I absolutely could without question or concern. Well, that may, that's a really, that's a, it's a good answer. And I'm, what I will do is I will reach out and get the information from cellularity um, okay. on, on the use of interfill. I will tell you for, for, for those who ask, um, cellularity also has a uh, biological membrane, a, a, a skin replacement product, cellular tissue product uh, called BioVance, which works very, very well. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, I want to uh, tell you, you all a couple of things as I close. So first of all, again, I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Duke and I want to thank um, Cellularity for sponsoring it, um, this conversation and, and our tale of Tuesday this evening. Um, being able to provide this type of education and provide information to patients um, is really what we're all about. Um, you know, I, I, I'm going to put on my, my little bit of a little bit of a tailor hat and let you know that um, people have asked on this webinar what the cost is of interfill. 
Um, Taylor has an exclu- uh, an, a, a very good arrangement with um, Cellularity and Sanuave, and um, it costs two hundred and fifty dollars for a, for a vial of the forty milligrams, which is what Doctor Duke uses. So you all can do the math, and you can figure out what's going, what what they what he is. Um, what his profit margin is on the cases. And I know doctors that charge significantly more in certain areas. Um, I'm also going to tell you that I I said, before you do anything uh, in your practice, always reach out to Taylor Medical. I can tell you right now, and I'm going to tell you, Dr. Duke, we have a partner with a company called Medical Wave. Uh, We've got great pricing on um, the Storch EPAT machine. Uh, We've got good financing uh, for people who are interested and um, don't worry, Dr. Duke. I'm going to have somebody reach out and contact you. You don't have to take any notes. All right. Uh, I was just writing it down. No, my, my, my team is listening right now, and I know that they're going to send an email out to you. Um, okay. You know, for those of you who use diagnostic ultrasounds or need one, Taylor has a partner with a company called a partnership with a company called Tenvision. They're actually the number one reseller of um, uh, re- refurbished ultrasounds, and you can get new ultrasounds as well. The company is fantastic. Uh, There's not a product that you can't get from them. And um, again, we've got good pricing, good financing for those of you who are looking at for end of the year acquisitions. Um, We are also partnered with a um, uh, Zuckerman Technologies for laser therapy. We've also got a great uh, end of the year offering on that. And I know that you talked about in your protocol, putting patients into over-the-counter orthotics. I'm not sure what product you use and it's, we are partnered with um, Ready Thotics, and we have a great opportunity to use Ready Thotics and get you a good um, acquisition cost for your practices. And um, again, these are all products personally that I've used, companies that I've used, and I, I do recommend them highly. And uh, I want to tell everybody that uh, our last seminar of the year is going to be coming up on December 15th, um, and it's going to be a a very dear friend of mine and uh, somebody who is well known in the profession, um, who has contributed a lot to the growth um, and advancement of the podiatric profession, uh, Dr. Lowell Wild Jr. Uh, I'll be moderating it with my regular sidekick, Dr. Mike King, another former APMA president. Um, he left me high and dry tonight because he had another phone call. Um, but uh, we are really looking forward to uh, having everybody back. Um, Doc Duke, really, it truly was a pleasure having you on the phone. I mean, having you on our call. And um, I will have my team reach out to see if we can help your practice in any way. But um, we appreciate the educational contributions that you've made to our um, members tonight. And I'm going to tell everybody to have a great night. I'm I'm running four minutes over. I like to be on time. And um, again, thank you very, very much. Thank you guys for having me. It was awesome. All right. Good night.